Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Tech Rapper Podcast. I'm Robert Scarpanito, your features editor. And Rotten Editor in Chief. Bernie Alva, staff writer. And I'm Dan Rockwood, staff writer slash lead ambassador to Inkopolis, because uh, no one else wants that title oh, for some I reason. I forgot. Yeah. Oh, hey, actually, let's settle that right yeah. now. How are, you, how are you and the four other Splatoon 2 fans yeah. doing? We hey, it's are a, great. Splatoon um, 3 is out now, by the way. It's We've got another <laughs> uh, Splatfest coming up soon, actually, so kind of relevant. Um but yeah, no, we're doing well. It's it's been great and wholesome time out here in uh, in Splatoon land. And are you Splatlands? Are you a kid or a squid? It really depends on my mood. I like to switch between the two. It's very fluid between them. Uh, hey, yeah, that's fair. You know. Yeah, I, I, you know, we, we joke. I know that Splatoon, uh, look, look, we'll get ahead of the internet comments. I know, seventeen million or whatever <laughs> units. Okay, people like Splatoon. That's all Japan, though. Yeah, would you here? It is huge. I'm like, I'm excited to visit Japan someday for a number of reasons, but being around an actual audience of people who appreciate Splatoon is definitely a big one on my list. <laughs> I, I think that's very funny that that's like <laughs> a big reason. <laughs> <laughs> I just want people to understand. No, there's like no. I don't know. I'm not even sure the number of people we have at Tech Raptor right now, but it's like it feels like I'm the only one playing Splatoon. I think you and are. I don't know why. I I can think of a few reasons. I don't know. <laughs> I you know, to you know, make you feel better, I have Splatoon, but I can't play because it, it makes me mad. Like I play League okay. of Legends, and League of Legends doesn't make me mad, plus Splatoon makes what? me mad. Wow. <laughs> Wait. Wow. <laughs> How? I don't know. Yeah. I get so angry. I'm like, I, I can't do it. I don't know. Frustrates me. Dang. <laughs> is that what it is? Is that Splatoon just anger inducing? Maybe that's what it's all about. Is I do it use it as an outlet for just a lot of aggression. Like some people go to Call of Duty, like Splatoon is my Call of Duty. <laughs> All the is my call of duty. Blood. Back, back of the box quote <laughs> tech raptor 2023 yeah. oh boy get that quote to nintendo immediately <laughs> i i'm still fucking fascinated that you're like because there's so many people that want to go to japan you know for like anime or like to learn the language or to see yeah. that dog in shibuya and you're oh. like I want to be with my people. The squid my Splatoon kids. people. <laughs> yeah, I want to meet fellow squid kids and I want to go to a Pokemon Center. Those are like my two biggest things. Fair. Fair. I mean, I get the second one. The first one, I just, I'm just struggling. <laughs> but... Well, yeah. today on this podcast, we're actually starting our journey in Faerun and going into the internet because that's just where a lot of this discourse has been going. So we're, we're continuing our discussion on Baldur's Gate 3 from last week. If you want kind of our general thoughts on the game itself, you can check last week's episode. This week, we're, um, there's been some discourse that you've probably seen, uh, and by the time this episode goes live, it'll be about a week ago-ish, in the past week, um, but we wanted to give our take on it, because it's, it's just, it's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of shit being said on, online, and uh, some of it feels a little bit unhinged, but if you're not aware of what this Tr Baldur's Gate 3 controversy is, we'll get you all caught up, and then we'll talk about it, but before we dive in, if you do enjoy the show and if you want to help us out, we would really appreciate, uh, you know, leaving us a review, hit subscribe if you haven't already, leave comments down below, let us know how wrong we are, et cetera, et cetera. That would be really helpful for us. So Baller's Gate 3 is the new gold standard for all AAA video games, right? So, so some say. So, so some say. <laughs> I see no controversy in that comment whatsoever. That's, yeah. I mean, you're just stating a fact, right? Yeah, it, they really should scrap whatever Starfield. I know it just went gold. Whatever it is now, they need to scrap it all to meet the new standard that Baldur Gate Three has set. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, to, uh, honestly though, how much do you think like Baldur's Gate Three reviews are, are totally going to be affecting Starfield reviews now? <laughs> like people <laughs> like thinking about that. Like, well, I could do all this in Baldur's Gate. Oh, what the fuck? Like, uh, I could put a whole ass human in my bag in Baldur's Gate. Yeah, why can't I, could, I do this? And I could just stuff a, two humans in my backpack and yeah. walk around them. Um, so this all started. Uh, I think I think kind of tweet zero for this was uh, that tweet thread from Xavier Nelson Jr., who is the writer behind games like Hypnospace Outlaw, um, who was very, you know, he, he's very excited about Baldur's Gate three. I mean, who wouldn't be? It's a pretty great game. Um, but wants to caution people from treating it as a gold standard for all RPGs, all games, etc., because it kind of came out of 
really unique circumstances, right? Like Larian has been making Baldur's Gate for like 20 years because it started out as Divinity Original Sin, yeah. right? <laughs> um they they have a engine that's like hyper specialized to do exactly all of this stuff right and they have a team that's hyper specialized to do all of this stuff like they are the team to do it um so to assume every other team should aspire to do the same thing you can't assume that'll always work out and there's more likelihood of that leading to studio closures or things along those lines and then a destin Legary from ign put out a video um Oh, do you do you all remember the name of it? It was it's uh, no, it's it's probably the biggest offender of all this shit. It's a it's terrible. Baldur's Gate Three is causing de some developers to panic. Uh, was the name of the video, which is very uh, stokes the flames, right? Um, but his point here, what uh, Legary's point is that consumers should want more from game uh, from game developers should ask them to raise the bar and it shouldn't be a problem that Baldur's Gate 3 is raising that bar. And I think he said in that video, uh, why was the first response to defend the current state of AAA gaming as opposed to saying, hey, maybe we can learn a thing or two from Baldur's Gate 3 and make our game better for our customer. And maybe we should pause here and at least just talk about these two. Cause I think these two are kind of like the biggest, um, yeah. yeah, in, in parts of this discussion of this debate there are people who are falling on weird different sides on like like things that even both of them haven't established um <laughs> so maybe we can go around the room and maybe we can start with Brittany. what are your general thoughts on on why baldur's gate 3 is the new standard for all video games <laughs> Yeah, it's just so good. It has to, everything else has to follow it. Obviously, all games are the exact same. They're all mirrors of each other. Um, no, I think that they're like games have to like appeal to make money. And so, like, obviously, if they have to make, I'm trying to put those thoughts into one. <laughs> Someone else go first. Let me like get my thoughts situation. Sure. Okay, Dan, what, how about you? How are you feeling about all this? Well, I think, um, you know, the concept that Baldur's Gate 3 is making some developers panic. The next, like, PAX I go to, I want to talk to developers and be like, so what was your panic state like when this game came out? And just hear it, you know, directly from them. But I think there's... Um, I'm I'm very much like like a centrist in this debate. I feel like because I totally respect and understand developers and development cycles and... I think as a community, uh, players and consumers have been much more understanding of things like avoiding crunch time and allowing teams the time they need to make games like this. Um, likewise, uh, there has been distaste toward like mic microtransactions and things are just constantly trying to, to make money off people. Um, people are really looking for a finished, like polished product that they can invest in and enjoy for very long period of time. Um, the issue is that games that do microtransactions tend to make quite a bit of money off it. So there's like that, there's a whole capitalism aspect of this, right? And so I think we just need to not necessarily hold every other game to this, like a standard or or say, you know, well, Baldur's Gate did this, why aren't you doing this? I acknowledge that games are, are gonna be individual, um, like investments and endeavors from, from different developers. Uh, but at the same time, like there's, my my biggest thing is like just just make a game and release it and release it when it's ready and release it when it's done and don't have like game breaking bugs day one that you're then gonna get a whole bunch of angry tweets about um, mm -hmm. and it feels like Baldur's Gate uh, the 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 release um, and the number of players that have been on and the way that things have been handling it's got like I'm people are playing it people are enjoying it it's been getting a, a ton of you know positive feedback online from from that respect which has been uh, you know cool to see. Yeah. yeah, Andrew. Andrew, do you have any immediate off-the-cuff thoughts about this? Uh, it's. I, I think as in all dumb controversies, like the truth is in the middle somewhere. It's not in these extremes. In that, did it, the, there was some panic, but not in the way that IGN presented it. The panic was all was in. Um. Well, we'll get more into uh, like Ramy's tweets later and other indie devs. It's just like fuck the big execs are going to take the wrong thing from this and that they expect games to to be at this level and they're going to want devs to make this and if you try to pitch something that's not this they're not going to want it mm -hmm. that's where the panic is and i think that's a fair panic because the suits are stupid in that way 
and what they want to take and and uh they always take the wrong lesson it feels mm -hmm. so i understand the panic that way um but i i think that uh, like as dan was saying we're people are pretty good at discerning um what things are and what they can be like i don't i remember i wrote our witcher 3 review and i think i the subtitle it was like the new benchmark for rpgs or something like that or open world rpgs oh, it set the golden standard the new not golden the gold standard. standard but it was the new benchmark to reach and it's not it's not like um i think games like Baldur's gate are great leaps forward and yes i do want devs to learn from them and take cool ideas from them but to have the uh the this weighty expectation of all the stuff that they've done is absurd. And that's true for anything. Like if it's, if some amazing movie comes out that does something cool, we're like, well, it doesn't have, you know, Oppenheimer has this cool explosion. -y stuff. Where's your cool thing now in your movie? Why didn't you um, almost build a nuclear bomb? Yeah. Instead of CGIing it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's just, it's just stupid, crazy talk. I think we're, that the, the the gaming communities and people that play games are pretty smart in what they like and you, you'll just get dumb loud voices and in the you know expecting it but Baldur's Gate let me do xyz mm. kind of thing right Brittany I want to throw it back to you in case you have a yeah anybody. yeah no so the like we have like really good games right but like that the standard the average game can't be like a 10 out of 10 that's not that's not how that works and so if you have a game that everyone's like oh this is like such a great game you can do everything for it that can't be the standard because then it won't be that great of a game mm -hmm. and so yeah. just throwing that in there <laughs> totally agree i mean yeah like average by definition right like there has to be something yeah. in the middle. um yeah and i think too this is, this is a good time to like bring in rami ismail's tweets as well because like we were you know dan you kicked it off talking about capitalism a little bit being a part of this problem and i think that is definitely one aspect I think we can maybe start diving into. I do think Legary's video at IGN, it it kind of, um, I feel like it presented t like three or four different buckets and tried to wrap it all up into one as like a singular silver bullet um, that I would like to try to dissect throughout this, this podcast and this discussion. But maybe we can start with the capitalism one because part of Legary's point here is that uh, Larian had a commitment to no microtransactions, ergo Baldur's Gate 3 is amazing. Yeah. And like, I, you know, sure, that's a good thing. That is like for, for people who don't want microtransactions, don't really want skins and whatever, that's great for them. Uh, whether or not that's the silver bullet, I don't know. Um, I will say Redfall did not fail because it didn't have microtransactions. I also don't remember if it didn't have microtransactions because that's clearly irrelevant to Redfall. <laughs> Right. I don't know. Fortnite's a pretty cool game. But pretty it has good. a microtransaction. <laughs> oh yeah. It's so bad. it's not that good. Never mind. Damn. No no one plays it either. Nobody. So you know I discovered <laughs> that. <laughs> you did discover it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but so Ismail came in and uh, basically said that all of this kind of fails. Like vote with your wallet, sure, but we live in a capitalist society, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore every, like it kind of is a moot point um because of just where we live and how we're doing. Uh, in this in, in this capitalist world. And I think Legary replied to him and was saying like, oh, but you know, there are other ways to do it. What about Game Pass? And it's, I mean, you're still paying, right? Like you're still voting with your wallet in a way, right? Well, and I think Rami's, uh, was it Rami or Rami? I don't think I've ever, no, is it Rami? I don't know. I'm not sure either. I don't think I've ever heard. It. I've read his name a fucking ten. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he was saying, uh, and I think this is a a good uh, point to make, and it's kind of it is scary for um, smaller devs is that we're getting back to you know you're pitching it to the one room again. If if we're getting to a point where like Game Pass is no quite we've talked about it uh, so much on this podcast. It's no question the best value for someone wanting to play games. No question. Um, but if we're getting to the point where like we're getting to that subscription model, or, like there's a game pass and a game pass alternative or whatever that might be in the future. Um, and that's kind of where games go to live or die. And there's not as good of a marketplace outside of that. Then it's, you're really all in you know, all of our eggs are in one basket and devs have to go to one spot. And if they don't appease that one spot, whatever they want, good or bad, whether we think they provide, you know, it's a good service for the industry uh game devs are suddenly like well i guess we can't 
we're not making that we can't make that game now because they they said no and that's like the one avenue that we have um because i know in one of those debates uh, someone's brought up like well why don't you hey, think that's why don't you just you know you can get unreal make your own games he's like, like one of that, that i don't that's such a stupid thing just make your own game it's like do you know who you're fucking talking to like this dude talks to people about making their own games all day every day that's his yeah. job uh and also and he, is is, is the point here like well if Baldur's Gate three is so good make your own Baldur's Gate three well, like I... and it's like well if you want if you don't want a game like that make your own game kind of a, if that that dumb thing will make your own it's like you're so stupid like that's such a dumb thing mm-hmm. um, but I think it's a good point in saying that it's it's consolidating the power of what games do get made and that if we have a game pass like thing we have a higher chance of like of someone being like well we're gonna go with the algorithm or whatever this 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 is the lane that works. We're not going right. to be as risky necessarily. Um, there's a higher chance of that stuff happening. And he said, you know, we're years away from seeing that because it's, it's a cascading effect down the line. But um, that part does kind of suck. Mm. If, if that's what the lessons of, of these kind of games are like, well, not just Baldur's Gate, but Tears of the Kingdom and Elden Ring and stuff like that, that if that's what um, the people with the money think that people want and that's all that they think about and then you know you these weird experimental indie games that come out won't come out anymore yeah. or at least fewer of them right um that would suck yeah and i, and I think too the, there's a, another point that they made in their threads where it's um it is all about chasing the money right like oh, yeah. it, that's unfortunately one of the problems with a capitalist society in a way right so even if we want more of these highly polished no microtransactions like creative vision games to come out um there are like like dozens of millions of them on itch.io if if you really want to find like you know just one person was like fuck all the games out there i'm gonna gonna unity my way into this industry you can find a ton of stuff there for sure um but you're not gonna find a ton of articles on games media websites about them because people aren't playing them or buying them yeah, and like it's more important and vi- financially viable to report on a new gotcha character in Genshin Impact because they're a cute waifu, and that's gonna make money. Yeah, well, and that, I think that was another thing that he was talking about with the uh, voting with your wallet. It's like, well, in these microtransactions, it's like things like Genshin make a shit ton of money because people are obviously willing to buy the microtransactions. Yeah, so... Brittany. Yeah, I was about to say I just dropped some money like two days ago. So that's what I mean. Like it's it's fine, it's, it's, it's a model that works, and people are comf- enough people are comfortable with as much as games media and people in the industry like to rail against that kind of stuff. It's it obviously has its audience and people that are okay with it, and they're gonna keep doing that as long as that exists. Yeah, exactly. I think players forget or they get. Um they feel like every game that comes out either needs to be for them or they need to play it and it's like that's that's not the case like they can there can be huge popular well-polished games that you just don't vibe with and and like that's okay um there's so many other teams out there to look at and other games to look at and it's it's you know there are too many games that come out in a year for us to talk about them all so we focus on like you said the ones that people are buying and people are playing but there are so many others i mean go to any digital storefront and you'll be able to find like indie games and and really you know niche games that people love that maybe just don't get talked about as often um a future of of microtransactions does make me nervous in the sense that i don't want like my playtime to be devalued if i choose to not engage in that system um i am one of the people who have been playing gta 5 for like almost 10 years now and um gta 6 makes me a little nervous or the concept of it makes me nervous because you can buy shark cards in grand theft auto 5 that effectively give you money in game to spend on cars and guns and whatever you want i have only ever bought one shark card and it was like an intro thing that gave you like a million dollars in game and i did it to jump start a couple of things um i checked my stats the other day i have earned like something like 176 million dollars in that game and i've bought almost everything you can buy i run a ton of businesses like i i own los santos at this point um so gta 6 makes me nervous because of rockstar uh and i i don't know the exact stats but i know that they i mean they continue to make money 
off of GTA 5 with all of these transactions. Um, I'm just, I, I got to imagine they're going to lean even more heavily into it. And they're, of course, a huge studio, but I think we're going to see and continue to see some ripple effects from that um, across the industry. And there are some companies that seem to be uh, not diving into it as much. Nintendo historically has not done a ton with microtransactions, but they have done paid DLC more recently. And I think we're going to start seeing more of that. So this seems to just be like an industry trend in a direction that we're going. Not to say every single game is going to have it, but I wouldn't be surprised if over the next decade, we're going to see more and more kind of adopt these um, types of systems where it's, all right, we invested in this game, the time it makes this game and let's sell it. And then how can we continue to turn a profit from uh, mm -hmm. having this game be you know played by people over periods of time? Um, so it's, it's, it's just a whole thing. And it's, it's a cycle that I think is going to get moderately worse before we start to see any kind of improvement or things start to turn around in the other direction. Yeah. But I also think it's kind of a sliding scale, right? In terms of microtransactions, it's not a binary, does it have it or does it not? Is Therefore, yeah. it's good or bad, right? Uh, which is which is a, one of the takeaways I got from Legary's video, whether he intended that or not. Yeah, that's a different that was discussion. the implication. Yeah, the implication is if it has no microtransactions, it's, it's a higher chance of being a good video game, which like, right. so you're talking about GTA 5. GTA 5 has so many microtransactions that Rockstar makes more money than God, right? Um, but at the same yeah. time, I think you would be hard pressed to find anyone who would look at GTA 5, even now 10 years later, and say that's a bad video game. Like yeah. GTA 5 is one of the greatest. Like it's it's in the top, you know, 50 at least, right? Definitely higher mm -hmm. even. Um, and it had microtransactions. So it's it's kind of like oh. there's definitely some games that implement them in a very shitty way, for sure. And there are mm -hmm. other games that do them fantastically whether you're going to consider you know dlc expansions as part of this or not you know that i mean we can even get into the discussion of what dlcs and expansions are good or bad right but even games like uh genshin which is like it's it's like a casino almost right it's like a revolving door mm -hmm. of like you can spend you know 10 bucks a day on that game easily right and you could still have your fun with it because the base core game and maybe our Genshin uh, expert can comment on that too. Um, itself is good, you know, like it's it's a built in yeah. system that you don't need to pay, but it's so good that you want to. Yeah, I didn't, I've played the game since it was in, it's like pre beta. And it was like, I, did, I didn't spend money on it for like a year and a half of playing it. And I've continued to play it since it's released. And it like Hoyaverse has gotten better at better at like using the money they're making and making better stories. Like they're investing in different things than they were in the beginning. And it, like, and there's so many free to play people. <laughs> so it's, it's so there's that aspect of it. You don't have to play, but there are gotcha games that like you can't, you can't do that, you know, for sure. So cap, we live in a capitalist society, but yeah. I don't know if that necessarily is the reason Baldur's Gate 3 is so good, right? No, well, I think it's, it's, it's the contrast of seeing something like, you know, the, uh, the recent uh, the PlayStation showcase and then the story of them working on like nine games of service games or wherever the hell it is. It's like an absurd amount. And I, that PlayStation showcase, they had some of those shown and it was like, boy, those look bad. And it was just one of those, um, like I was saying that the, the people with the money and making the big, big brain moves at these companies are taking the wrong lessons away. Or, I mean, like, as we've said, it's really a scattered shot approach is that if you nail one, like it kind of is a revenue stream that sets you up for a lot of stuff in the future. Like if you get just one going, if you get one destiny, if you pivot like GTA five, because GTA five didn't start with all this stuff. It was just a game. And then GTA online became this fucking behemoth after the fact. Yeah. Um, but if you can get something like that, like it really sets your company up, like it's a one steady stream, and that sees you what Sony's doing. But I think when you see the, the attempts and the failed attempts at various companies like your anthems and whatnot, um, and then you compare it to, which is funny because it's Bioware, and then you compare it to like Baldur's Gate three, uh, you're like, boy, what the fuck are they doing? Like, <laughs> like they're spending, they have a team that's just as big or bigger and spending a lot of money and like that's what comes out of it i think that's where a lot of people are like what the fuck is going on like why shouldn't we expect a Baldur's skate 3 ish thing or a tears of the kingdom ish thing or an elden right. ring like thing mm -hmm. out of it 
And it's like, I don't know, some companies are just better making games, dude. Like, <laughs> and, and not only that, but I think it, it goes back to what Xavier was saying in the first place, where some of these developers are specialized into doing yeah. what they're doing. Like, Elden Ring was a culmination of a lot of shit. Yeah, hey, Zelda. guys, Elden Ring is just Dark Souls 4. There are three <laughs> other what? ones of them. How dare you? There's, there's also Bloodborne. And there's yeah. also, like, Demon Souls, yeah. right? Like, Do you they, know how many fucking Zelda games there are? Like, they kind of know what they're doing with that now. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And Uma's right. been making it for decades. Mm -hmm. He's been the guy. Yeah. So they, they have that pedigree, right? But then, you know, if like I here's the thing, like if Larian was like our next video game is going to be a shooter, like I'm not going to say no to it, but I'm going to be a little bit more skeptical than if it were like Divinity 3, right? Because like I like Divinity 3, I know they're going to knock that out of the park. Like I have no doubts, right? Um, so I feel like that's that's the difference there is that there's a little bit of the experience they have. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, one thing I kind of want to jump into now as well is uh, the idea of early access. I know that was one of Legary's other points is that Divinity, or not Divinity, Divinity 3, Baldur's Gate 3, um, yeah. had that like a long period in early access, right? Where they had, I think it was three years, uh, like yeah, starting in 2020, that. and then it just came out in 23, oh, yeah. um, where you know you could play Act 1, and it was, you know, if you played it on, on day one of early access, it was buggier, it was sort of placeholders, it was, you know, not all the quest lines were fleshed out, et cetera, but you could play it. And by playing it, you provide feedback. And with feedback, they can iterate. And with iteration becomes genius, right? <laughs> Apparently. Um, so that's, that's another one of the points that like Gary made is that they, they were not afraid to be vulnerable in early access to end up with a viable product. Or a better viable product mm. and they took a big risk in doing that because like the community could have turned it on them like that like it, cool. it and that could have ruined everything so it's easy to understand why other developers don't choose to go that route mm -hmm. yeah like i don't think it's it's one of those silver again it's not a silver bullet for every studio like if call of duty modern warfare 4 <laughs> again was was like we're doing early access i'd be like why hey we have early access weekends right like <laughs> yeah the betas right <laughs> um i think on the flip side of that with the early access um i think i, I don't know if it had didn't have the Baldur's gate name you really wonder how much it would have been successful in that way in terms of people being interested. Because if it, there is an argument that you could make, and I think it's a fair thing to discuss of how, um, while yes, it's kind of like they're getting a big, uh, a shit ton of play testers and QA people for free, or not even just free, that they're paying them to let to be that for them. Yes. So from like, it's a, it's a big brain business move, like, oh shit, we get all these free, we don't have to pay people to do this, they pay us? That's fucking wild. Um, <laughs> So I could see the appeal of that for a team, um, and I could and I could understand why uh, people would think that maybe a big company, another big company, would be like, "Oh, that is pretty genius. We could uh, make some money that way um, and take advantage of it when they really don't need it." Like you know, something like <clears throat> you know, Call of Duty. If like six months before it came out, they're like, "Hey, we're doing early access, and you can help us make the game." It's like, "Fuck off! This game is not changing in six months." <laughs> like you're just trying to get people to pay like get in early essentially yeah. um so i don't know i think it is great that it worked for them and larian's always done crowdfunding or had a big community thing because i think even original sin and original was original sin 2 on kickstarter also original sin was the first one the first was for kickstarter sure. i know both of them though were early access yeah yeah they did that um so it's worked for them as a studio and like, like you're saying it's it's a case-by-case -case basis <laughs> But again, like I, my, I guess my big point is like it, the, the big top, you know, suits always take the wrong thing. Like, oh, we, we should do early access then. And then it won't be as good. It'll essentially be a glorified beta where you, nothing's really changing. And the game is basically done. You're just paying them early money for a game that's not done. I may be getting an inferior product because of it. Um, and they're going to exploit people that way. I mean, I, I'm talking about hypothetical. That's I. It's too, that might not happen, but yeah. I don't know. I'm sure some game will. People are like this early access fucking sucks. 
mean, it's not a one size fits all solution, right? I know yeah. there were those um, early like play access weekends for Diablo Four that, to my understanding, were like pretty successful, and players yeah. were able to you know give feedback and and kind of let the developers know through you know comments and everything else kind of what they thought. And to my understanding, the team was able to implement like some of you know the feedback that they were getting. And so when Diablo Four launched, I think part of what fed into that success was they were listening to their community and they were updating a lot of things. Um, I know some of the more recent patches have been, uh, you know, less popular, uh, arguably. <laughs> um, but there's uh, the, when you have a team who's willing to listen to the people playing the game and and not give in to every request because not every request is going to be a good request. You're going to get a lot of uh, a lot of dumb uh, things in there. But for the stuff that will make the game better and more fun and more engaging, I think it's definitely worth it to have um that even before a full launch uh but it's definitely a risk and, and like Brittany said you could have your um your community just turn on you if it's uh if it's you know not as well done as it should be then you've alienated your entire player base and the game isn't even out yet yeah. um so you it's it's kind of a risk management type thing and i think that from a developer perspective you need to be really confident in your ip before you go in and are willing to uh you know release it at an earlier stage um as opposed to just you know doing the full launch and kind of seeing where things land after the fact yeah, yeah. It's, it's, there's a big difference between those play weekends and what larian did too like several years before it came out and you know doing something that's you know six months before it came out with the it was a limited window for people to get in on those are very different things too. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm amazed how long Baldur's Gate has been in development for. I have been to multiple PAX East conventions where they had their huge like setup and that was their big, you know, key game they were showcasing. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's incredible to see, you know, the timeline that goes into this. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a grown person at this point, but I think about you could have, you know, a kid in middle school who could be ready to like be going into college you know by the time the game was between it being announced and it being fully finished and released and that that's just insane to me from like a timeline perspective yeah, yeah. i think with early access to it does it depend it really really depends on the game you're playing and the game you want right like i love god of war ragnarok i i would fucking hate playing that in early access though because that's not a game yes. where you're like let's see what the first act's like let's let's give it a try you know it's, <laughs> that's a game you want like start to finish it's like a 40 hour movie that's what you want out of it right mm -hmm. um but then well, i mean there's a reason why if you google early access i'd be willing to bet that one of the uh the, the google autofill words is roguelike after it because <laughs> roguelikes are perfect for because you're going to play yeah. them over and over and over again the story mostly doesn't matter i mean some of them it does but most of them it's like whatever you're just here to find the cool loot so early access makes sense for that Baldur's gate i would say is in a weird space where like yes it's a narrative game but it's one of those games where it's like there's 50 different outcomes for every quest so I and mean, it's not a roguelike but there's definitely like the whole i'd want to replay it again anyway yes. i was talking with austin our other uh, staff right now saying this is such a strange game where i've played i don't know a lot of it now and the whole like not the whole time but there's so often I, I cannot wait to play it again i've never had a game do that for me like i want i can't wait to see what happens here i have like two other different characters i want to try to play the game through i'm like there's no fucking way i'm not spending 300 hours on one game i don't have that time but what if you did but i probably who knows like i was telling him, i said i might never play another game again i'm just <laughs> like this will be all the time i have yeah I mean, it, it truly could be one of those kind of <laughs> games right like I'm, I'm playing three different playthroughs right now and all three of them are so i i killed all of the druids and one of them at level two i didn't want to do that but it's it's where the die rolled and uh it's where we are now so monster yeah it's it's one of those for sure you can like play over and over which i think is is also elevating it in this like this golden standard kind of mm -hmm. kind of space right um but i just I, like i think we've established i don't think early access is that silver bullet either i don't i, I don't know if that like is really relevant to well it's relevant to Baldur's gate's success i don't know i, if I would be... say that undoubtedly early access played a big role in Baldur's gate 3 success no yes. question i can't say that it would then play a big role in every future video game success ever you know 
definitely too. agreed. I mean, there's 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 nuance in all things, and and I know there are a lot of people who probably don't want there to be. They want the you know simple, hey, easy answers. Hey, hey, shut up! There's no nuance <laughs> on this show. <laughs> You're right. Facts are facts, and it's yes or no, and nothing else. Yes, it's all um, black and white. But I, I remember I got into a, a mini debate with another sta uh, staff writer on the Tech Raptor team, and it, it was it was about um, Starfield. And I said, you know, I am a little disappointed personally that Starfield is a single player experience. I want it to be multiplayer. I think it's a perfect multiplayer thing. And his response was, well, not every game needs to be multiplayer. And I said, I'm not saying that. I'm saying this game should be multiplayer. I don't think every game should be, but Starfield, you know, fits perfectly well with that. Um, and there are, you know, certain games, I, I try to take each game as its own thing and, you know, things I would want to add or things I'd want to subtract. Um, that's part of the reason why I've enjoyed Tears of the Kingdom so much is because I do feel like they have built upon some of the uh, things that were lacking in Breath of the Wild, and they've managed to expand it in a really cool way. Um, and that game, you know, of course, has had its own performance issues and running on Switch and, and all that. That's besides the point. Still doesn't take away from the fact that it's a it's a super fun and, and ultimately finished game that you got to enjoy right at launch. So there's you know, looking at games as, as individual things and, and critiquing them, I think is fine. Trying to take one game and saying, okay, every video game should be like this. That's where you're going to get lost in the conversation a bit. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, like, you know, it's, it's kind of gospel at this point that GTA five is just, it is one of the greatest, right? Yeah. That is the exception. Every video game should be GTA five. That's what I want in my next Pokemon. That's what I want in the, uh, the sequel Hell to yeah. these. Yeah. Yeah. Who's, I, the, who's I wanna... the Trevor of the Pokemon world? I want to play that guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I yeah. play the shit out of that. But, yeah. but I think that's kind of my point though, is that, you know, Rockstar, I mean, only Rockstar makes Rockstar games. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I can't think of another game that feels like GTA five besides kind of Red Dead Redemption two, but even then the genre, the, genre yeah. and, and narrative and all that's very very different um but you don't see this i haven't seen a rush of of games in the last 10 years that were like we need to make our gta um i guess maybe the last one's that saints row remake um which you know, uh, i think uh, after like it was the vice city days that there was a bunch of people trying to be like grand theft yes. auto but like once four came out there wasn't as many and then five was just like oh god i think part of it is because what devs see and what they're seeing i think with Baldur's gate where we're not going to see a lot of Baldur's gate like things it's just like holy fuck that was a lot of work and a lot of time because that was our last big discourse was like hey games should take less time to make and be like maybe not as long because that would be cool um and like the games that we're talking about like tears of the kingdom what breath of the wild came out in 2017 and uh tears of the kingdom came out six years later um and i mean it's one of the only zelda sequels where the map is i mean it's different i mean obviously you have the different things but like a lot of the game was in there and mm -hmm. they still took six years to add all their stuff that they did not to say that they didn't add much because they fucking did yeah um but it took a long time and Baldur's Gate 3 was in development a long time i don't know how long elden ring was in development but um oh, yeah i don't know that one I might mean, we... be a little different we knew about that for a long time, right? Because I think it was at yeah. least 2017 when it was like George R. R. Martin. Something like that. Yeah. He was like, yeah, then now he was writing with it or something. So, like, these games take a long time to make. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, even these these games that are supposedly might be chasing or Baldur's Gate or Tears of the Kingdom or an Elden Ring, are we're not going to see them for five, six years. Yeah. 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 I was just racking my brain to think like, okay, so who, who, what developer, what big developers would be the ones that see this and were like, let's chase that. And I don't know if it's a good or bad thing that Ubisoft <laughs> came to mind first, but um, Immortals Phoenix Rising, which is a name I always struggle to remember. And I'm very surprised I remember it when I finish remembering it. Um, that was very clearly like, hey, this Breath of the Wild thing's, uh, it's pretty good, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should do that um so who knows maybe we'll see a uh a, a turn-based totally not maybe it'll be it'll be pathfinder you know um, um it'll be a pathfinder game from ubisoft uh, uh, i don't yeah. think so but yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i i just don't know if if there's gonna be a lot of people trying to mimic what Baldur's gate 3 is doing this is like a one time in in a like decade kind of game you know what I do think what we're going to see, though, 
is that the three games that we keep bringing up, um, well, I, like everybody's kind of bringing it up because they're big tentpole. They, a lot of people talk about in terms of game design with Elden Ring, Cheers of the Kingdom, and now Baldur's Gate 3, is that the one thing they kind of all share is this um, emphasis on player creativity within the game and like really letting go of the reins a bit and letting players just figure shit out. Um, so I think that might be a bigger trend we see in whatever genre, whatever that means for whatever genre that belongs in. Um, cause obviously tears of the kingdom and a Baldur's Gate three are very, very different in what that means. And even Elden ring. Cause I mean, the big discourse of the Elden ring was like, Oh my God, the way they do open world's amazing. And why was that? Well, players get to do whatever the fuck they want yeah. kind of thing. So I think we might see that kind of stuff mm-hmm. going forward, which I wouldn't be against. No, but... no, I think that's the the lesson devs will take, and I think all the bullshit is what the execs will take. Like... Exactly, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. I, I think at the end of the day here, um, it's it's kind of the publishers that and the big wigs and the Bobby Kotick's of the world that I feel like are going to steer this this controversy in the wrong direction in five yeah. years when we see the the fruits of whatever labor comes out of it. Um, I think it's a good time maybe to bring in uh, so Jason Schreier uh wrote this article a little like he, he writes a, a newsletter but in this one he wrote about the real secret to Baldur's gate 3 success in his opinion is that it is not a publicly traded company it is privately owned therefore they don't have a shareholder to report like their ceo is sven right he's he's the one who's like i want to make this game we're going to make it the way that we're going to make it like we don't have a deadline we don't have publicly traded stocks to worry about we're just going to do what we do and for me i think i mean that's a part of it that's the i think that's why that creativity it's kind of like with a movie when like someone's a writer and a director then you know like okay if it's bad it's one person that fucked it all up um <laughs> but so in, in this way it's kind of like okay it's all in-house you know it's all larian you know like they're the ones controlling everything the vision the money the development etc which can be good or bad. And in Larian's case, I think it was pretty good for them. Yeah, I see no disagreement there. Any publicly traded video game company mm-hmm. just makes bad games. It's just it's just a fact now. Sure. It's been put out into the world, That's and that is thought, what yeah. we can all now accept. Mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah, Tears of the Kingdom, garbage. Shit video game. <laughs> Agreed. Forget everything I just said like 10 minutes ago. It is just <laughs> awful because Nintendo's public trade. Um, no, I mean, there's, it's such a, like, it, go, it goes back to the whole capitalism thing, right? I mean, if you have investors and shareholders that you need to please and understand, I mean, that's why things like quarterly things happen and why I can pretty, or like we as an industry can pretty accurately predict when we're going to get like uh, Nintendo Direct now because it's like they need to showcase something for the investors for the next quarter of what they're doing, what they're releasing. Um, you don't have that kind of pressure if it's a privately owned company and they're able to kind of do their own thing more and in a way like we talk about creative control so much especially in the film industry and um like you mentioned scrappy having that uh you know writer director and one person kind of being at the reins of it you might still have a studio that has some form of of control or say over uh, how the script goes or anything like that but you do have more control versus a, a gigantic um you know team made up of all these different parts kind of coming together so i think it's a part of it but it's it's not everything and it's not something like it's it's um you know we're talking about like what's that what's that silver bullet it's it's not this it's not the fact that they're not publicly traded um that is not the singular thing that makes this video game good it was obviously a number of factors that came together maybe that was one of them but even if it was i don't think it was the biggest deciding factor on on what made this game good because you can have a team that works really closely together work for years and end up with a, a pretty average or, or subpar game um so it's uh you need to have the the talent and the motivation of the people working on the project and then they themselves need to be treated well and given time to rest and time with their families and everything avoid crunch time and all that when those factors are met that's when i think we get better video games and when the whole industry uh gamers included definitely benefit when those uh standards are met mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to think maybe it's not a silver bullet. Maybe it's like a silver like magazine 
or a clip you know what i mean like i <laughs> to just stay in the metaphors lane right it's, it's a lot of things that that go yeah. into making a good video game believe to it or be not. to be fair to Shry, i don't think he's saying like it, it's only publicly traded games or like that's what it, you're guaranteed not necessarily guarantee but it's a big factor in why you make a a game could be better if you don't have this publicly traded investor stuff to worry about. I think a point that he's making that he's probably right on is that if Larian was a publicly traded company, Baldur's Gate 3 wouldn't be Baldur's Gate 3. Yes. And I think okay. that's a fair statement to make. Um, cause you'd get these investors or somebody thinking like, well, why are we putting all this effort into stuff that a lot of players aren't going to see? And that's kind of the point of the game is that through one playthrough, there's a ton of shit. You're just not going to see mm -hmm. like, that's going to be vastly different. Um, one playthrough to the next. And that's the purpose of it. And if you're trying to sell that to someone that's like, but I need to make money. Why are you wasting all my fucking money? Like this stuff that people aren't going to mess with. That'd be a hard sell for someone that doesn't understand stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think that is a fair statement to make that something that is as creatively risky as this very likely would be, if not not made, vastly different than the way we see it now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a fair point to make that these publicly traded uh, games usually, um, and obviously there's exceptions, but usually are not as creatively risky or interesting uh, of games. Um, I mean, you get your Nintendo's is almost always an exception. It feels like almost everything because they're that's what they live on as being fucking weird, yeah, and being cool <laughs> with their designs and game design. But like when you mentioned Ubisoft, I, I just couldn't help but laugh. It's like, dude, that was like the game where like Ubisoft the game review years ago, and that hasn't really changed. Like, all their games are pretty damn similar. <laughs> and as much as I, I love a good Sony game, like, they're all they all have a, there's a formula. Uh, mm -hmm. that's working uh, not to say they're creatively devoid of stuff but like it's it's all around out of the same lane yeah. kind of thing so i think what what Schreier's getting at is a fair point to make is that that create it's it's the same thing of like it's 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 just the independent debate versus not yeah. indie games is where like real creativity like a bunch of weird shit happens because they don't have to they don't care they don't have to make money to somebody or whatever worry about an investor um and so yeah. Larian's like a unicorn in that way of being this big company. It's, I mean, it's kind of like a CDPR kind of thing. Like they're a big independent yeah. thing that could be creative and do whatever the fuck they want kind of thing. Yeah. I was going to say like Lar Larian's kind of that upper limit of, even indie, though they're right? publicly like they're, traded too now, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Larian is like, they're independent, but they don't necessarily, like when you think of indie, all indie games need to be Baldur's Gate 3. That's right. That's the real takeaway. We've been talking AAA. Yeah. But... Silk Song? Fuck that. That needs yeah. to be Baldur's Gate 4. There's a reason it's not out yet. They keep seeing like Tears of the King. They're like, fuck, we got to redo the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, every time a big game comes out, the standards change. All video games need to meet the new standards. Right. That's how, how game development works. Yeah, easy. Just scrap it, start over. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one thing I do want to kind of get back to with this, uh, I, f I feel like we have, we've been giving Destin a, an unfair shape. Well, he did make a lot of, I'll say, I don't know. Points. I think that's, it's um, one of the worst things IGN's put out in a while. Personally, it's pretty I, yeah, bad. It's, it's pretty it's not bad. Great. But I, I do want to at least say like, I think there is a point in as consumers, right. Which I know that we're all four of us are a little bit more like privileged being games media, right. We, we have a little bit of a different take when it comes to video games, but I think it is totally fair for consumers to want more, to sure. hope for more and expect for more. Right. I think that's like, yeah, I think that is a great point to make. And I think that's maybe why that video resonated a lot with uh, like a lot of people online. Like if you look at the YouTube comments on there, um, some of it's worrying, but a lot of it's very yeah, like, but pro so my my mm -hmm. uh, response to that be is like, where the fuck have you been this year? This year has been yeah. one of the best years in gaming, period, mm -hmm. and it continue it will continue to be. Like we've had Baldur's Gate, Tears of the Kingdom, freaking Jedi Survivor came out, that was great. We've had so many crazy good games this year already, and Starfield's on the horizon. Like there's a ton of shit coming out. Um. I mean, uh, uh, the Resident Armor, Evil 4 remake, Armor, Armor Core, Core 6. 6 is like, like in yeah, like it's it's like, okay, you can want more, but it's like, dude, yeah. like we've been having banger after banger coming out. 
so f- lately like games are in, we're we're doing very well in terms of the quality of games that we're getting at the moment so it's like i get wanting more but it's like dude like they're putting out some good shit like it's not like we're in a, a real low at the moment it's not like it's what 20 what 2014 or 2016 which was like uh, those are rough years go back and look at those years yeah uh, we're not hor- <laughs> like i i think it is funny that like gary ended his video like he, he was he was you know worked up and joked about like fine maybe i should just not care about it and buy my horse armor and i'm like dude Such it is old... 2023 the zoomers don't know what you're talking about buddy <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of that i just man i mean like wow. i think he it's, it's like this video if it came out seven years ago maybe like i would have been fair point. 2016 you know what, like the big game that year was overwatch and then uh, Doom, <laughs> not bad games, but if you compare yeah. like that's the the big games of 2016 to this year, you're like fuck that year sucked. Like <laughs> just because you had such a breadth of games that are across quite a bit of genres that are like holy shit, like there's a bunch of good stuff. It's just a wild year, so it's just a fu- it's just a weird sentiment to make this year of all years. Yeah. Like <laughs> to I me, mean, definitely I think- is um, most years I'm able to complete like between twenty and twenty five games. For some, that's a lot. For some, that's not that many, depending on you know how often you play. Um, but I can usually tackle my backlog pretty well. I've had zero time to go for older games this year, and even newer yeah. games. I have not finished Jedi Survivor yet. I haven't finished the Dead Space remake. Uh, I still have um, like I'm, I'm working through Tears of the Kingdom. Like there's just so much there. And and I like I'm so excited Starfield's coming up soon, but I'm also severely intimidated uh, that I now have that game to add to it. One thousand to worlds mention, to like, go to. Spider Man yeah. Two's coming up in October. Yeah. Like Sp- we didn't mention the Spider Man Two. It's gonna and be a, a big eyes of Pinocchio. With everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, so it's just like yeah, my I feel like my video game playing time has not gone down, but it's spread across fewer games just because of how big some of those new titles are. So it's just taking a lot more time to uh, to get through all of that. Mm-hmm. And. I, I know that uh, like the brand IGN is not a hive mind. I, that's not how game sure. journalism works. But I do find it very funny that Resident Evil 4 Remake has a 10 out of 10, I think, on the review. But it does have microtransactions. So checkmate, Uh-oh. Destin. <laughs> you got to get <laughs> fucked. <There you go. laughs> bring bring I mean, Destin on next week to defend yeah. himself. We can do this live. <laughs> I, I just, I mean, like that's. I think that's just the whole point of the video, though. It's like it's it's such a silly point to make. I think that like binarily microtransactions are a sign of good or bad it's like no that's just not how we, we've unfortunately or fortunately however you want to see it we've evolved beyond the point where microtransactions are a signal for anything i mean if anything just a signal for capitalism not of quality anymore yeah. i think certain i think it very are. much pulls in that idea of like people are just really annoyed with like games as a service or, like having like long form games like i mean even league of legends where it's a free to play game you can buy skins valorant genshin we talked about already like there's so overwatch which we've mentioned too like there's so many of these games that are free to play now at least with overwatch 2 like it's free to play but like you can still spend money and so many people hate that idea that like i th- I feel like that just feeds into that that mindset of people that are like i can't stand any of this <laughs> it can't you, be good uh, you know what's like beautiful and this is totally a- another episode or another like maybe this is an article in the future i want to do all of those games you just listed that are like microtransaction live servicey games like they're usually some of the most popular video games out there and also mm-hmm. like if you go to any of the subreddits for them there's always more hate than love i feel like like everyone fucking it's it's like they hate their job kind of energy right but they all still play and there's definitely some i don't know if it's stockholm syndrome or like some there's definitely something going on like psychologically where it's like yeah this sucks i hate this video game anyway see you at five in the lobby you know it just it always happens and i think that yeah it does suck and there's like this weird negativity around it but there's also clearly a silent majority or at least a majority of people that will still like sit down and well, play the game. I think it goes back to that sentiment you're talking about with Destin and then those comments you're saying that we want games to be better. They're invested in them, obviously, and they want more out of it. But I think it's there's a little bit of a delusion with it also where people get too invested in some mm-hmm. stuff. And we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the the low percentage vocal minority in this area. Cause obviously something like Genshin's massive has a, so many fucking people playing it, like ninety something percent of them you're never hearing about. Never hearing from them. They're just playing the game. They're just doing, going about their business. 
kind of or like thing. League of Legends. Like we played the yeah. game for ten years at this point. I'm not gonna not play the game. Like I yeah. want to see where it's gonna go. <laughs> I hate it every time I launch again. Like why am I stuck in this forty minute game? Like I hate this so much. But I'm I want to see what's going on. You can like, escape. <laughs> there's a way out. There's there's escape Uninstall. routes. It's called Dota. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, here, here's a question then. As, as someone who's played League for ten years, whenever riots like patch notes just dropped are you are you like let's read them i'm on let's go i read the highlights they've gotten really good on instagram about like how mm. they do their how they do their um patch notes but i don't have any hard opinions on them because i'm like this is going to get changed i got <laughs> a bad like, question oh, man, for you. right now i'll just wait for two weeks <laughs> well, i have a quick follow up oh, okay go that. ahead go the ahead. other three people on this podcast did you even consider the fact that league had patch notes and so you're like oh yeah i guess someone said pat <laughs> i guess so yeah of course they have patch notes uh, but you're not I... You don't worry. I about played it. WoW and play and read all patch notes whenever they came out, so I'm very aware of these. Yes. Yeah. I, I, the point I'm making is like you don't <laughs> give a shit about patch notes unless you are in like your yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Game, right? correct yeah or yeah. if there's something like specifically wrong with the game that I'm waiting for them to change <laughs> that I'll look at the patch notes to see if that has been fixed yet. Um, my favorite two league related things uh was there was like a you know gaming meme or did you know gaming meme i saw once that was like you know millions of people play league of legends but nobody actually enjoys playing league of legends which i thought was very funny um another one was the league like facebook account or twitter account asking years ago like hey like you know thanks for playing like what hero did you win the most games with this year and the first comment was just like don't answer they're gonna nerf that character so like don't tell them and then the league account just responded with like a smiley face so it's like i kind of like when they like troll their own user base like that um but there's just i mean all games have toxicity i feel like i've seen a lot of it in league unfortunately um i just i've never been able to get into that game personally i know it's been huge and continues to be huge um but yeah it's like you know someone who has played it for like a decade and continues to you know enjoy it even if you do get sucked into like a 40 minute match and then you're like oh shit like where'd my day go like yeah. you play three games and you're there for a couple hours it uh it can definitely add up yeah i, I think league i've always said the best part of league is not league of legends like it's everything yeah. but <laughs> league of legends itself <laughs> everything else is so much better in a way um but it's also the biggest salt mine in north america so it's it's just the way it is you know <laughs> Andrew, did you have a, you have a question? Or yes, really? my question would be: as someone who's played League for ten years, uh, how what lessons do you want Riot to take from Baldur's Gate three? For yes, that's right. <laughs> how, how can Baldur's <laughs> Gate three make League? <laughs> uh, don't make it free. Make it charge us sixty dollars for oh, it. Oh, perfect. There, there you <laughs> go. We weed some people out. We need League of Legends yeah. two that costs yeah. money. Oh, uh, yeah. Take a page from uh, Overwatch. Yeah, that's, that, that works. Playbook. Yeah, then you know block a bunch of heroes we have to unlock heroes that yeah. there you go mm -hmm. make it instead of 5v5 make it 4v4 <laughs> league just keep reducing Completely. it until you just get down it's like a one-on-one -on -one match change it <laughs> one -v -one. i think that's what some people want anyway yeah. <laughs> uh, one -v -one -v. Meet it mid. Uh, middle lane yeah. yeah the overwatch version of like fox only final destination no items like let's go <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think my my overall worry with this controversy is, and maybe this is a bit hyperbolic of me, but um, so just reading the comments on IGN's video and just that, seeing the kind of language people are using when they agree with all of Destin's take, it it sent me back to the year 2013 and 14 for for for, for gate related reasons. Um, there's just a, there's just a lot of like yes gamers rights the gamers should should want more from their games and like I I think there it's it's a tricky sentiment because that's something that's like on the face you agree and then there's more hidden underneath the surface that it connects to right um, yeah. not that, I'm not saying like IGN is the new like you know uh, GG shaman or something right no they're just they're just the big guys that get everybody they're the big general audience like they're just always that's who they're going to be they're probably whatever um general sentiment you're probably seeing from their stuff is a good take for uh, the community most likely in terms of a general look at something mm. like oh, what are people generally taking away from something i would guess right at least the people that comment. That's the other thing you always got to remember. People that actually say something, it's always the fucking dumbasses that yeah, always want to say bias. something. Yeah. Uh, um, and there's plenty of people that don't say anything. 
Um, yeah. But yeah, I think the, my biggest thing with this uh, that I want to think, try to remember, and I want I would like people to remember is uh, that we're at a point in gaming now where like generations don't I don't think matter anymore. Like, sure, is there a big difference between a PS4 and a PS5 game? I guess, sure, I uh, sure. Yeah, tell uh, but that it's story. not not that big, <laughs> mm-hmm. not that big of a difference, really, in terms of we're talking game design. We're at a point where game design is kind of we can get a good breadth of anything. Um, you know, I'm not watching some small budget movie and wondering why they don't ha- have a you know hundred million dollar CGI fucking dinosaur, or some nonsense in it. <laughs> For the same reason that if I pick up some some indie game, I'm like, why can't I do everything like Baldur's Gate in this game? I, there's a there's room for everything to exist and um we've hit a point where uh that i mean we have such availability across so many different markets and so many different avenues we're not tied down to a singular console that's making the decision on everything that's being made or just a couple of consoles like there's so many ways to get stuff now um that the idea that all games must be or all games or will take a certain lesson or whatever from whatever game is just crazy. Cause I was starting to think of like old, like games that came out, let's say six, seven years ago that people were or like a Witcher three was, did everything become Witcher three after that? No. I mean, was it influential? Yes. Um, I just, the same thing's going to happen here. Like yeah. it's, it's the same thing. People are going to take what they want and move on. And there's, there's such a vast uh, variety of people that play games in different genres. That's what's so unique about the um, games to me is that the, the crazy amount of very specific genres, not to say like obviously music genres, there's a million, um, but games just seems like such a, I, I don't know. Um, there's, so there's a lot of, yeah, it's so very like it's so varied and like so, like a sim like some strategy game versus a shooter. They might as well be to- a different medium, kind of like feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, that there's always going to be something for somebody. There's audiences around. There's people. Mm. Uh, so I think that the, these doomsday like oh my god we're gonna have all these games being affected one way or the other. No, mm. it's not gonna. Even if I'm like being all pissed about what the execs are gonna take from it. Well, what's annoying about that is that, I mean, most of our discussion has been about AAA stuff, and I think that is where we're going to see the most negative effects, uh, if there are going to be any. But also, I think that's going to come largely from the people that we know are bad actors or take the bad takes anyway, right now. Like, when people think of wanting more out of games, I'm sure they're thinking of certain publishers or devs who don't do the right thing, like, Mm -hmm. make a bad decision or do the wrong thing. A lot of the time, like, is Nintendo going to change much? Nintendo's going to keep trucking on, man. They're going to keep doing what they're doing. Uh, I wouldn't expect anything different from them uh, in terms of what they do. But, you know, Ubisoft, who's uh, at a moment of they couldn't maybe not exist soon, might be doing some wild shit soon. Who knows? Um, so people like that. I mean, I I thought that with the the new Avatar game coming out, but the gameplay it looks it looks great. It looks all right. It, looks all it, right. It, it does look like Far Cry. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, it's Ubisoft. They got to make their game. Ubisoft the game. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, I I think like what I think forward of like indie games that are coming out soon or on the horizon. Right, I'm thinking of like Hades two, and if I remember right, I believe Supergiant said that's going to be early access first as well. And just like Hades was, yeah. Just like Hades one was, and in my mind, I'm not like, yes, just like Baldur's Gate (laughs) three. Thank thank God they're doing, they're following Baldur Larian's footsteps. Like it's gonna be great. For me, it's more like, I mean, Hades one was pretty fucking good. Hades two is probably also gonna be pretty fucking good. You know, like yeah. There's so many different reasons to to think something could end up turning out well. Um, Just because one game was successful doesn't mean every other video game has to do the same thing to be successful. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Brittany or Dan, do either of you have kind of like any final thoughts about Baldur's Gate 3, this controversy, the silver bullets, the werewolves? I just just think people need to like 
appreciate a good game for what it is like if it is a top tier game like let it be a top tier game and like don't expect everything else you play to be a top tier game or don't be so like nitpicky with every game that comes out after to be like well Baldur's skate 3 did this i'm not playing this or something like that like just calm down it's okay <laughs> just enjoy the games yeah there are different ways to be top tier Absolutely. I mean, I don't think we we judge all games across just a singular benchmark because there are so many genres and, and development cycles and things that that change. Um, so it's it's very much going to be on an individual basis. I think that games can be inspired by some of what Baldur's Gate has done and try to apply that to their own. But it doesn't need to be a full like every single thing they do, they they take on. Um, but as you know, developers, especially as they uncover or discover e maybe easier ways to do things or new ways to do things that might catch on across the industry and allow people to maybe make games uh, a little bit more quickly without spending as many resources on it and without taking the you know immense amount of time from the development team that they need. Um, I know we're definitely not there yet. I don't know if we ever will be there. I, I definitely don't want a future where AI is just like pumping out games left and right and you just don't have a development team anymore. That would be very bad. Um, but I you know, am hoping that the, the good things that Baldur's Gate has done can be reviewed and, and maybe applied to some other games in the future, but it does not need to be every game. And, uh, you know, the reality is, as as Andrew said earlier, we're getting a lot of really amazing games this year. And I think um, as this decade continues, and I've been very aware of, um, we started the 2020s with like the PS5 launch and the new Xbox, um, you know, Switch was at, at the time only a few years in and now we're beyond that and that is still getting a ton of games. Like we're getting a lot of really good stuff this decade. And I think this is just another really cool benchmark that we'll be able to look back on and, you know, kind of show where the, the path of game development has been going um, and where it will continue to go. But I think we're in store for for some really incredible experiences over the next several years. And it will definitely be in, in part to, you know, the success that Baldur's Gate has seen, but it's going to be countless other games or games are going to want to be uh, doing stuff that Tears of the Kingdom has done, assuming Nintendo doesn't, uh, you know, draw patents for every single thing in that game that they can do. Um, and, uh, you know, any other game that is, uh, you know, big or high profile that we see will be uh, in there as well. So, yeah, not every game needs to be Baldur's Gate, but I'm sure that there are some elements that uh, other games will be able to take from it for sure. Mm. Andrew, any final final thoughts? Oh, I, more or less what I said, and it's um, it's funny with Baldur's Gate 3 being, you know, a isometric RPG that it is that because that's it's been such a super niche genre relative. I mean, they didn't sell they, they sell felt well enough they're always pretty small games that this is the one that's doing it for people is also pretty funny. Mm -hmm. And another good example, like there's all games are not going to be this. Like, I mean, are we going to see some, some more CRPGs come out of it? Like people are going to make it. Sure. Cool. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is such a one-off in that way. Uh, it's, it's just all the stars align. Like we've been saying with Larry and being the perfect studio, le having the money and time and talent to, put into it um early access working out being pretty perfect for them like this everything kind of aligned to make this work out so yeah. all games aren't going to be that and there's plenty of plenty of small games with a focused vision that will still come out mm -hmm. uh just hopefully that the funding will still exist for them because i know that's already been getting harder and it's just going to keep getting harder um so hopefully that will uh i don't know get better in some way we'll figure something out Probably not, but it'll probably get worse. <laughs> I, mean, I, I echo your sentiment. I, I think we'll still get weird. Like, Joseph Ferris is still going to make video games. Do not worry. There will still be creative, weird fucking video games out there. <laughs> like, you know, he, even though he works with EA now, right? Like, he's made pretty unique games. We'll see more probably. Um, I think, too, with, with all the stars aligning, I think one thing we haven't touched on is, uh, I mean, D Dungeons & Dragons has been having a moment for a while now that that one little known actor matt mercer he does some kind of small niche podcast that uh you might not have heard about critical role you know <laughs> that it's just kind of just 
made D and D like cool, like actually cool. You know, like if you tell your grandpa that D and D is cool, he'd be like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> um, so, <laughs> I think it's just Baldur's Gate three came out at a perfect time to be oh. what it is, and it also is like oddly hearkening to me. It harkens a little bit back to Bioware's heyday, or it does. Uh, funnily enough, this is the first game with Bioware magic in years. Um, I know there's like a a writer at uh, Larian yeah. who was like, "We hope we did them proud," uh, in, in reference to older Bioware games, because this is truly that like every dialogue choice matters. Like all your your skill checks really matter and can drastically change the outcome of everything. And it makes you want to, like Andrew said, makes you want to replay the game. And there's just a lot going on here that's going just right. And it just hit the market in a way to get enough visibility where everyone's like, everyone who is interested is already playing this game. I think it has, it may not have reached saturation yet because it's not on PS5, but I think we're, we're seeing the peak of where market saturation could be for this game. Um, I don't know if it's going to like go beyond Counter-Strike because Counter-Strike is still like king of Steam charts, but it's a pretty Yeah, but nobody story. talks about Counter-Strike still. Yeah. It has all the players that it has, like absurd amounts, but when do you ever hear anybody talk about it? Like no, never. no one. Yeah, it's true. But all, 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 all I think is I'm... B- before August, I thought Game of the Year talks would be boring this year. <laughs> Yeah, so did I. Uh, I thought Tears of the Kingdom had it kind of wrapped up. Yeah, and now it's uh, <laughs> now it's interesting. Yes. Well, I mean, it, and it continue will continue Starfield. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's probably bad because Bethesda made it. But um, <laughs> and, and if you want more about that, tune into next week's episode. We're going to go through a bunch of Bethesda games. Uh, but yeah, I think I think that's a good wrap on on this Baldur's Gate three non Really, it's kind of a non traverse. I feel like it's just a lot of people just making yeah. mountains out of molehills you know hey that's what um, the good gaming industry and media is good at well don't don't tell them that oh. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean i think if here here's here's the takeaway you should have if you if you're enjoying Baldur's gate 3 continue to enjoy it if it is not your video game that's fine there's like we said seven or eight <laughs> other very good video game names in the past ask, hour ask us i'll give you a recommendation there's like <laughs> I, I, any genre yeah yeah like just just play what you like if it's if it's your 1000 and first hour of league of legends go for it yeah that's only a thousand i think what come on what are you at what's your number (laughs) 10 years oh god (laughs) how how many months have you lost yeah we were talking about our wow numbers i had i had a character that was over a year of playtime oh my Uh, gosh so I wonder if they have a tracker for that. They have a tracker for money spent. <laughs> the they gotta have playtime time in there, right? Door. They, they gotta. gotta. They yeah. Gotta. yeah. I know. My Grand Theft Auto Five stats are very flawed because it says I have like 1,200 hours in that game, but a lot of that is just having my character walk in circles with the joystick um, pressed <laughs> down so that my businesses will accrue money over time. So I'll do that. <laughs> I'll have him walk for like 12 hours, and then I'll get on at night, and then I'll just sell like all the product that my businesses made to make money uh which is how i made my 176 million so Whoa. yeah the the actual grind, the in that grind game set over blood. here yeah, still playing. i think that's still count- i mean the same way like wow you're yeah. not that's not like every hour and wow is spent raiding you know yeah God. fair i mean i like raiding but that'd be a nightmare <laughs> It would be. Uh, but that, I think, brings this show to a wrap. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Tech Raptor podcast. And if you did, please leave us a review on whatever platform you're listening on. Hit the like button on YouTube if you're watching there, or leave a comment down below and let us know what, what's your take on this Baldur's Gate 3 controversy. Are you, do you, are you picking a side? Do you not care? Have you shagged Lazel yet? Is that your vibe? You know, let us know. Comments down below. She's very aggressive. Harlack, baby. Sure. Yeah. Um, but let us know all of your thoughts down below. Or if you have a question for us about Skyrim, Oblivion, Fallout, um, Fallout 76, all of the all of Bethesda games, we're gonna we're gonna do like a deep dive on Bethesda games next week um, to to you know Four prepare two. for Starfield. Um, there are gonna be some takes that will be said that I think will be interesting. But if you have any questions for us that you'd want us to talk about, we would love to we would love to ponder that on next week's episode. Um, and you can find us there on Monday. And if you want more of us, we're also at techraptor.net, news, reviews, features, etc. all throughout the week. Um, we will have reviews coming up for some pretty big video games that, that you want to keep an eye on for sure. 
But if you want more of this show, we will see you next Monday.